Good evening, everyone. We're continuing our series. Today it's number 13. Uh, if we get lucky, either today or next week we will finish this series for sure. Bezrat Hashem. And uh, just to refresh your memory, last week, uh, chapter 12, we spoke about, we started to speak about the need of a person for social life and for appreciation. He wants to be appreciated by people and he has a social need and it's very important. Of course, some people when they're born, some has more needs for socialism and some less. And some people has to be appreciated for every little detail and some not. But it also influenced by the parents and by the teachers of that individual, how they raise him with the ears and things that they tell him increase or decrease those two needs. Some people, they reach a level when they sit and learn Torah that they don't really need communication with the world. They can be 50 years sitting with the books in a room and they don't care that they don't speak a word to any person. Some people, if in 10 minutes they don't speak to someone, they become depressed. They have to get the phone, text, call someone. They, they're afraid to be alone. It's very interesting how extreme it can get to both sides. Appreciation, everyone needs appreciation, even great people. If somebody writes a book and nobody appreciates it, even if he's a very big chacham, it obviously bothers him. Even if he is good with hiding it, inside it bothers him. And the people, uh, you know, that they actually want acknowledgement from people. If a big rabbi gives you an endorsement or says say something nice about you, th then you get the feeling, wow, it was worth investing so much effort into what I've done because I got the acknowledgement from someone that is great. If you remember in previous lectures, we spoke about getting honor, but from whom? Sometimes it's better to get honor by one person than a thousand. Because who are these thousand? Thousand ignorants who don't know anything from their life. They can compliment you about something that doesn't get you anywhere. Because you understand that they don't understand your level. But if somebody huge, great, he admires you and he acknowledges you and endorses you, then you say, wow, look at this big chacham. He endorsed me, that's more than 1,000, 10,000, or 100,000 ignorance. We spoke about that. Uh, in Chazal, this is where we finished last week, and we will continue with Rat Hashem now from here. Chazal, in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 100, they bring two examples how a person can re get relief from worry. We all have worries inside our mind and the heart, and we suffer from it. That's what people call stress. Sometimes it's sadness, sometimes it's depression. Uh, I, a person feels uptight. He has, he's not in a mood. It, you know, it gets him uh, not concentrate on certain things. All these symptoms is because something inside bothers a person. So the Gemara gives two opportunities how to get rid of this problem. One, it's based on the words of King Solomon. When a person has something that concerns him, he bothers, it bothers him and he's worried, talk to someone you trust. Get someone, it could be a rabbi, it can be a good neighbor, it can be a good friend, brother, sister, parent. Someone that you trust, that you know is a listener, and as soon as he lets you speak, automatically it comes out of your chest, immediately half of the problem is gone. Before he even offer you a solution to your problem, already you feel great. That's, by the way, one of the secrets behind psychology. When you go to psychologist, if you really know how, how it goes, from 45 minute session, you speak 44 minutes, and the psychologist speak one minute. All together, one sentence here, one sentence there, and that's just about it. They make you talk. Because even modern psychologists understand that when a person speaks about his problems, immediately he gets a partial relief. And the other option in the Gemara is, That's first option. It's second option. But there's a difference. The first, it's with chin. 
meaning לשוחח, you'll talk to someone with shin, יסיכנה, sin, and יסיכנה with סמך, it's almost the same word, and it sounds the same, but it's with סמך, not with shin, and what does it mean יסיכנה? It's called להסיח מדעתו, הסך הדעת, you clear it from your mind, how do you clear it from your mind? You focus on something you like. So there's a big event coming, a business, you just made money, a song that you like, something that will take away your mind from the suffering into a place of happiness, right? So if a person is able to control his mind to think about something he likes, immediately the something that he suffers from is going away. Right, let's continue. Uh, today, I will continue from where we left last week. There is a very important thing that we should understand, that the nature of the human being is to identify himself with, in, with his environment, with his society. A person is born with this need. The, it's called koach ha'izda'ut, the ability and the will. A person is willing to identify with his environment. So, meaning, whatever he sees around him affect his behaving, affect his understanding and affect his actions. Meaning, we ever say, a person is a product of his environment. If you put a person in a certain area where all the people over there are not modest, lack of modesty, it's the moral of the place. This woman also will be like that, because that's how she grew up. She wants to be a part of the group. She doesn't want... Actually, I got an email from a convert. She's in the process of converting. And she lives in a place when all the people there are... They're lost their humanity. I mean, they, they walk on the street, much like animals. And because she dressed modest as a part of her process of converting, Every one of the women over there, right away ask her, why are you dressed like this? Meaning, why are you not normal? <laughs> Everybody, well, well, no one dressed like you dress. What is this? Long sleeves and skirts. The people, obviously, in a place that it's mixed, like here, Queens, Brooklyn, when there's so, much, so many Jews, and then you have Muslims that dress with dresses and all kinds of things. So that, you know, it's a part of life. It's half and half. But the place that everyone dressed like Sodom and Gomorrah, and all of a sudden one tzaddik besdom, right away they acknowledge him. Hey, if you live in a place in a kibbutz, everyone is chilonim, and all of a sudden you're the only one with a yamaka. Immediately everybody is wondering, who is this crazy guy? That's how they look at you, right? A person wants to identify with his environment, and he is influenced by the environment. The music he hear, the clothing that people wear, and all kinds of things like this. He does not want to attract attention. He does not want to attract attention that I am unique here. I am different. So whatever he gets, and he sense with his five senses, he buys it, inherit it from his environment. From the time he's born until he becomes more and more mature, the society, the environment around him, even his family and neighbors and friends and school, influence him more than anyone else in the world. Of course, then comes books that you read, autobiography of all kinds of great people that influence you, movies that you watch, lectures that you listen to, change your life. But it will be almost impossible to get read of the habits that you inherit from your environment, where you grew up. For instance, accent. Here is an example accent. Accent, you hear, when you're a baby, you hear people talk. You imitate them. You speak like them. Why don't you speak in a different accent? You make yourself a unique accent. Did you ever see someone who grew up in a certain country and from a young age he decided to speak different than others with his own unique accent? It never happens. Everybody imitates what he, who he listens to. His parents, teachers, whatever he listens from them, that's what he, he copy them, he, he imitate them. 
So we see later on in a, in a later age, it's almost impossible to change. Even you want, you can work hundreds of hours to change your accent, you cannot change your accent. You came from Jamaica, people will know for the rest of your life you're from Jamaica or from India or from Israel or anywhere you go. It's very difficult to change the accent which you got used to. There's other habits. There's other, some habits it's going to be easier to change. Some it's very difficult. There is positive identifying and there is a negative one. You identify in a positive way you ident identify with a negative way, meaning depend on what you see. If you see violence, sometimes that's what you imitate. If you see nice traits, classy people, that's what you imitate. It can go both ways. But this habit of imitating what you see exists in every person from, a, from the day he was born. People think that the behaving of children it's a genetic DNA that you're born with. There's nothing you can do about it. You got it from your parents. Usually, it's not true. There are certain things you get from your parents, it's true. But most of what you get is from your environment, not from your parents. And it's not in your DNA. If your father is angry, it doesn't mean you have to be angry. If your father is Baal Chesed, is generous, doesn't mean you're born generous. What you see people doing around you, that's how you're going to be. Meaning, if you grow up under your father's house, then whatever you see from him, it will influence you. If he's angry, it makes you angry, yes, because you see all the time yelling and screaming. But if your father gave you for adoption to a classy religious family, that the father over there never yell, he speaks politely, everything is like, you know, with manners, it doesn't mean that because you are born to an angry wolf, your DNA is that you have to be an angry wolf. No. The stepfather will give you traits much more than your biological father. Do you understand? Therefore, if you take a kid from a horrible crime neighborhood and you raise him in a very nice Jewish religious family, he's going to grow up a mensch. And if you take a son of a very big rabbi from a very good family and you take him away from the family and you put him in this crime neighborhood and the way the people talk over there, that's how it's going to go. And you're not going to be able to say, wow, how come he doesn't have the DNA of his great tzaddik father? He has his DNA. DNA doesn't make your habits, uh, your, your traits, what you're born with. It's something you learn from where you are. Same thing in Shivot. You learn in a good yeshiva, it's affecting you very much. You learn in a bad yeshiva, it's also affecting you in a negative way. Okay, so a person is really getting it from his environment, not from birth. And that's how he identifies himself with what he sees and people that are around him. It's a natural way. So... If you find a person that is getting angry exactly from the same things that anger his father. So then the mother says, you became exactly like your father. You have his genes. Not true. Because he saw his father 5,000 times getting angry about something so silly, he also got it. From his subconscious, he already identified with this kind of behaving. But it wasn't something that you gathered from your father's DNA. A negative way, it, it, you can divide it to two categories. The simple one and the deeper one. The simple one is that the kid identify with the negative part of his father or mother, right? Meaning, his father can be righteous and stingy at the same time. Tzaddik meaning keep Shabbat, eat kosher, pray, go to shul, don't steal, don't speak Lashon Hara, watch his eyes, live modest, all kinds of, have a munai, all kinds of things. All of a sudden, when it comes to money, very difficult to get money out of him. Very difficult. So the boy identified with his father's stinginess, but not with his righteousness. Meaning, he also becomes stingy like his father because he identified it as a positive thing, my father is smart. 
He is not a fool that giving his money to people. Go to work. Why are you coming to me for money? I'm going to be like him. He comes from his subconscious. His father is cheap. The boy is cheap. Okay. But he did not learn from him being righteous. Why? Because he was born with laziness that he brought from his previous life. The father is not lazy. He gets up six in the morning, he comes to shul, he pray, he learns Torah, he does chesed, he does a lot of things that require efforts. But the boy was born with the same negative traits that he died from his previous life. Meaning he did not correct it and Hashem sent him back with the same negative traits to fix it. So he is very lazy. So when he sees that his father working so hard in Avodat Hashem, he doesn't want it. He hates it. I don't want to learn so many hours a day sitting like this in the heat, breaking my head. It's too much for me. I don't want to be early in the shul. I want to sleep until late. I don't want to do chesed. I don't want to serve people. I don't want to, you know, do all kinds of things that my father likes to do. He's crazy. I don't know why he's doing it. So because of one thing, he does not identify with this. Stinginess, he agree with, here you go. He follow his father's steps. In Chinuch, when you educate people, you have to try to diverse their identify parts to the negative. When you speak to a kid, you see, look, your father is so serious, how he comes to shul the first one every morning. You push him to that direction. Look how your mother is helping so many people not on a negative, because usually the kids will complain about the parents. My father is like this, my mother is like this. They complain. But the parents also have a lot of good things about it. So you have to learn to push them to the right, to, to, get, to identify themselves with the positive. Because his Yetzer Hara, his evil inclination, will push him always towards the negative and not towards the positive. The deepest level is when the kid is identify with the positive about his parent, but in a negative way, meaning the opposite. He recognized that his father is a very, very serious learner, but because of that, I don't want to be like my father. Why? Where did it get him? All his life he learned Torah, he knows everything. We barely pay the electric bill. I don't want to be like him. You understand? He acknowledged it, and now he's going to do everything to do the opposite. His father was very honest in the business, and he did not become a millionaire. But his uncle, which was a very big crook, made millions and lives in a nice house, and his cousins are all rich, and he's looking at them with jealousy. And by looking at his father, that he was a very honest person, he doesn't think, my father is a tzaddik, he has a share to the world to come, but my uncle is a big crook. He's going to pay the price. It's not that smart to think, especially when he's young. So he looks at that the opposite of the way he should. Therefore, what is he thinking? I'm not going to be so honest like my father. He's a fool. I'm going to be like my uncle. He's a crook. He cheats the customer. He makes millions. Why? Well, I don't want to be like him. Uh, he looks at that as a negative thing, meaning he identified the issue, but totally 180 degrees opposite. For, an inst for instance, I'll give an example. A father that is very strict to eat only certain kashruyot. He doesn't eat rabanut, only badat. There's many of kashruyot rabanut everywhere, he doesn't touch. It's badat, I eat. No badat, I don't eat. But why? It's kosher. It's also rabbi. He also had beard and a black hat. Why are you so fanatic? Don't tell me what to do. I follow this strict supervision. No. It's the boy, on purpose now, Make it obvious to everyone, I'm not like my father. Look, I eat Rabbanut. Meaning, I'm normal, he's not. I'm not like my mother, fanatic, wearing this schmatte on her head. Look at me, I have a nice up-to-date wig. I don't want to be like her. Meaning, this is how they look. In connection to the object, we have an opposite, we have a... a, a reaction that is an opposite from the object sometimes is because identifying because of the way he identified 
with his parents, he reacts in a negative way and on purpose does the opposite. Those feelings and reactions are coming from the subconscious. Comes from the subconscious. Because if you speak to him in an honest moment, you tell him, I don't understand, what is your complaint about your father? Your father is a righteous person. He has an opportunity to steal in a business. He trusts Hashem. He doesn't want to be a thief. He doesn't want to make money by making other people miserable. You should admire your father. So he will say, yeah, I do admire him. It's not that I don't. But then what comes from the subconscious, make sure you're not going to be like that. You're going to do the opposite. That comes from the subconscious. It's causing you to rebel against the good and to do the opposite. Sometimes I tell you where it comes from. You have a righteous father, but he's very picky. Every little thing you do wrong, he makes a comment. What they say in America, it gets on your nerve. After X amount of time, you cannot stand him anymore. And therefore, it comes from the subconscious that you will do everything you can to rebel against him. Even when what he say to you, you actually like it. You agree with him. That particular thing, if it was up to you, this is how you would do it. Because he told you, now it comes that you have to do the opposite. Why? Not that I disagree with him. Because he's the one who told me that. I'll do everything I can to do the opposite. And you don't do it on purpose. It comes from the subconscious. And that's why you see today, most of the youth, they rebel against everything they see. They rebel. The kids that touch drugs, at the minute they begin with that, if you interview them, not one of them would say it's good. They all know it, it goes to death. It, goes to the, it, it leads to destruction. It will clean you all from all your money. It will make you lose your future. They all know it. The kids are not dumb. So why they do it? Why? Because they were told 500 times, be careful, don't do it, don't do it. From the subconscious, on purpose, they want to do it. You'll be surprised, you know. There are two ways to react. Sometimes you come to a kid, don't do it, don't do this. Everything you do, make sure this one not to do. And now in his mind, this is only what I want to do. It's like taking a person, giving him a big mansion, 60 bedrooms. This mansion is all yours. Just don't ever enter this room. This room is locked. Do not enter. This room, it's out of your territory. 59 rooms are yours. Make sure never to go into this room. You promise? Yes. Check my hand. Goodbye. What happened from the minute you left the house? What's on his mind? How quick I can get into that room? But he, he knows it's not the right thing to do. Come on, I just got a nice gift. All they ask me is not to go to one room. That's, I, I agree with them. I agree. No problem. I'm not, I don't want to do it because it's, it's the right thing to do. I want to do it because I have this rebellion in me. Curiosity, you can call it. From the minute you told me everything is allowed except this, this is all I want. We call it in the language of Chazal, Maim Gnuvim Imtaku. Stolen water is sweeter than regular water. Water is always the same taste. But logically, uh, actually, in your imagination, you feel that it's better. You enjoy it better. I once gave an example. They made a test in Israel. They put two identical women, twins. Identical twins, even same clothing, same everything. Stand by the bar and all the Israeli wolves are coming now, one by the other, and they come to meet with them, can I buy you a drink, all this nonsense. And she say, I'm married, she's single, my sister. And 70% of them went for the married, when they have single one, same face. Why would you go to a married one if you have single right next to her, right? Now one of them did not, can say, I didn't think that's a problem. They all knew it's a problem. They all knew they do something not ethical, and they still wanted that. Why? Because the Yetzirah works. That's, by the way, a very strong proof that there is Yetzirah. If there's no Yetzirah, what reason a person has to go to something illegal when he has the same exact thing legal? Right? So here you go. So this is an example how the Yetzirah works.
identify with the good or with the bad. This power that a person has in him works naturally. Whether it's good things, whether it's bad things. Meaning, if you see something good happen, you identify with that and you want to do the same thing. You want to do the same thing. When you see something very bad and evil has been done, you also identify with that. It triggers your inclination, your evil inclination, and you want to do the same. Even though, when someone will ask you about it, you will say, ugh, disgusting. How can they do such thing? Uh, I cannot believe they're doing such thing. But inside you, you're dying to do it. Why is it? That's the nature of a person. So in a conscious, you resist it. And if somebody will interview you and even connect you to a lie detector, you say it's disgusting. I cannot even imagine how people can do such thing. And the machine shows you're not lying. Why? Because this urge to do it comes from the subconscious, not from the conscious. In a conscious, you know, 100% it's not the right thing to do. But this hidden sense in the back of your mind, in your subconscious, is creating desire to do it. This is, by the way, a part of the test that Hashem designed in the world. We call it in a general name, Yetzerara, evil inclination. It's a general name. But it can be broken to little cat subcategories. The, Ra the Rebbe from Brisk, he asked why Hashem needs to order Bnei Israel and to make them swear that they will not worship the shikutsim and the gilulim of the goyim. The goyim had all kinds of strange, weird, disgusting, idol-worshipping services. For instance, one of them, they had a statue, Baal Peor, whatever they served in a bathroom, instead of, uh, you know, throwing it to, the, to, a, to a pit back in the time and they cover it with sand, they used to serve it to that idol. It's very disgusting. It's something that a normal person should run away from it, just from the horrible atmosphere around it. Now, if Hashem knows that it's disgusting, why did he need to warn the Jewish nation after they saw the way they go and behave? Why do you need to warn the Jewish nation that just heard the voice of Hashem and got the Torah? Why you have to warn them not to go and, and, and do such thing? Did you ever see in the Torah that it's written, be careful not to eat people? The Torah does not order not to be a cannibal. There's no warning in the Torah. Why is it? Because what person would like to go and eat people? But you see there are people in the world that does it. On the other hand, the Torah warned a person not to eat blood. Who wants to eat blood? <laughs> Believe it or not, there are millions of people who drink blood. Even blood of people. So it doesn't make sense. Something that does not attract, I mean, it's not tasty, it's not like good steak or something that people love, and the Torah has to warn you from it, and the reward for it is great. Imagine when you have a desire for something delicious and you prevent yourself from doing it, the reward will be who knows how many times greater. So the Rabbi Mibrisk is asking a very good question. He says, if it's disgusting, why Hashem has to warn us so many times not to follow this kind of idol worshipping? The Rebbe Mibrisk answer, although it's disgusting, the nature of the human being, when he sees something very negative, really disgusting, in his subconscious, not conscious, in his conscious is disgusted. Ugh, I want to vomit when I see it. But in his subconscious, a desire begin for this. So Hashem said to the Jews, don't look at their idols. Don't look at their shikutsim, all the terrible things they do. Because once you see it, your desire begin to work. Your desire begin to work. I'll give you another example. If a person see a certain woman dressed on the street, not modest, and she's totally disgusting him, meaning she's not pretty in his eyes, not her look, not her body, not her clothes, nothing about her he likes. And you ask him, why are you looking at her? 
So, ugh, she's disgusting me. I don't even want to look at her. I happen to see, but there's no chance I ever like to even speak to her. You connect him to a lie detector, he will pass. He does, it's not, not his type, it's not his taste, nothing whatsoever. And when he says she disgusts me, he meant it one million percent. But that triggered his Yetzer Hara. Maybe not for her, but for someone else. The people are not aware that even disgusting things that you see and you want to vomit, they triggered your Yetzer Hara in that similar field to go later and do sin somewhere else. And that's why the Torah is so careful to warn us all the time not to look at things that even they are disgusting us. Many people ask, Rabbi, I understand there is mitzvah yichud. You cannot close yourself with a woman in a room and lock the door and, and close the blinds because the Yetzirah begins to work. So that's a woman that more or less is your age or younger than you. But what happens if she's 90 years old? She barely walks with a cane. Well, it's a grand-grandma already. She's double or triple than your age. You don't have any desire to her. So what's the big deal if I be with this, the grandmother of my friend? She's 90 years old, she barely walks, she cannot even get up from the chair. She's like, who even looks at her, Bichlal? The answer, you're right. Logically, you don't think to that direction. It did not even cross your mind. But... The Torah already knew things that you are not aware of. You only thinking consciously. Consciously I won't touch it. Consciously I won't touch Hazir. Consciously I won't eat monkey. Consciously I won't eat horse meat. Of course. But there are much more to the conscious. The subconscious. That's much, much worse than the conscious. Most of your reaction comes from the subconscious. That's why the Torah says, "Lo tatur achel vavchem vachem nechem asher atem zonim acharem." You understand why is it? Because it triggers all kinds of things that you were not even aware that they exist in your subconscious. We continue. We learn from here the conclusion so far that the human nature has two sides of identifying with. The good and the bad. Once he's exposed to it, he can make him seen even if those things are disgusting in his eyes. There's still a danger that once he sees it, he will trigger an internal desire uh, which will ignite the thought, the mind, which would lead a will to actually do something negative. Either that particular disgusting thing or something similar or different one way or the other is dangerous and it's forbidden we have a very famous psychologist Sigmund Freud who was a Jew not religious Sigmund Freud perhaps is one of the most or perhaps the most famous psychologist at least in modern history in his time he lived 1856 to 1939, just before the Holocaust he died, 1939. 1856, meaning about 107 years ago, he came to the world, and he left the world about uh, 80, 85 years ago. And he had arguments with the people of his time. There was a serious war between him and them. They look at him as a revolutionary psychologist. When are you coming to change all what we learn and we all agreed on for hundreds of years? Who do you think you are? Reinventing psychology? They did not agree to bring his books into the universities. The Torah of Freud. He said to them, you're all living in a lie. You're cheating yourself. Instead of educating for good, you are actually destroying the people. You think you're helping them? You're making them worse. And they say you are corrupted and your theory is all corruption. Because you're const co constantly speaking about the negative of the human being. You're speaking about negative, about attractions, about desires, about 
the animal instinct of a person. You bring it up. In modern, modern uh, 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 psychology, they write stories describing a person stealing or murdering. The authors, they claim that there is the reason that they bring all these negative in their books or in their movies for people to see how horrible it is to be a murderer or a rapist or a pedophile or a thief, all these things. See how horrible it is to be a criminal and that will scare you not to be like them. Because now when you see how they end, how they get killed, how the police kill them, how they end in jail, who knows what, or they live in fear, all these mafia people, and they're constantly on the run, it would make you not want to be like them. That's why it's important to bring it up to people's attention. By describing all of these desires and concluding that it's bad, that it's very bad. And the reader will learn to hate the bad and would like to be good. Sigmund Freud, on the other hand, disagree with them. He say, you're all cheating yourself. The reason why people enjoy to read these books about crime, about horrible things, phenomena, and movies like that, it's not because they have intention to educate themselves to be better and not to be like the criminals in the film. No, it's because a person enjoy the bad. That's his evil inclination. And he identified with what he sees. Identify. You see the mafia guy, someone he doesn't like, take a gun, psh, blow his head off. I wish I could be like that. Everyone who gets me angry, psh, I eliminate him right away. He won't say it. And if somebody will interview him, say, oh, it's horrible, it's a murderer, it's a monster. But in his subconscious, he actually desire it. And he has attraction to it. Why so many people are criminals otherwise? So a person identify with that. Sigmund Freud claimed that based on his theories, everyone wants to be a thief. Everyone wants to be a thief, but he has fear to steal. Why? Maybe I'll get... I'll get caught and I go to jail. Or that he's embarrassed that friends that know, will know that he's a thief. When he read the story that this individual in a story, he, had the, he was brave to steal and he broke into a bank and stole a million dollars and got away from the police, actually it gives him a huge satisfaction. Yes, he made it. He, was, he escaped. Why? is becoming delusional, like it's him. Wow, it's me, I got away. I made it, I made it. He identified with a criminal. Many of the books, many of the movies, even those from the conscious people will not identify with the murderer or the thief, but from their subconscious, they're 100% with him. So Freud claim that it's not going to help that in the end of the story you write a few words against the sinner. He will not make the people hate the bad. The opposite. You educating people to become just like them. You are creating the new criminals in society. You increasing the desire of the readers, of the readers, and they and they anxiously desire this, although it's unpleasant to a person to confess, and he won't confess when you speak to him. He definitely won't justify it in the public, but inside, in his subconscious, he desire all these kind of pleasures. He is jealous with the criminals that they all reach and live in mansions with bodyguards. And he's, he's, he's also identified and he's jealous with the rapist and he's jealous with this one and this one and all kinds of people and the corrupted politician because they control the world. Inside, it made him want 
It makes him want to be like them, although he won't admit and confess. This is the theory of Sigmund Freud. Who do you think was right? Him or other psychologists in his time? <laughs> Today there's no question anymore. The reason that you have a billion percent more crime today than a hundred years ago is because they made movies. As long as there was no movies, almost barely they had criminals. How many, crim how many murder cases you had? When I was a kid in Israel, a little bit over 40 years ago, you had one murder case in Israel a year. And everyone was shocked for years after that. For years. Nobody stopped talking about it. One murder case a year. Why? There's no television. No nothing. No theater, no nothing. They just started to come with films. They had these two rolls. You remember this? With the tape. They used to pull it. Well, nothing like today. And then you always got stuck. At one time you go fast. Sometimes you go slow. The volume works. Now work. Light. White screen, again, something, okay, excuse me, let me go back. That's how it was. Not like today, everything top of the line. As soon as they pushed it to the public, it started to increase the crime to such level that today, almost in no country in the world, they have control of the crimes. Some Arab countries, they are much smarter than us. They limit the level of crime that the people in their country can be exposed to. They won't show rapes, they won't show pedophile, they won't show gays, they won't show anything in their country. Iran, Saudi Arabia, places like this. Korea, North Korea, places, Russia. In Russia, some of the movies here are not legal in Russia. In Russia. In Russia you cannot praise gays. They hate it very much over there, the governments, everyone. If you praise them in the media, you're done. It's not like in America, you become a, a very, very famous reporter. Over there, it's not like that. So there are some places in the world that they still have old-fashioned, normal mentality. Everywhere else, see what's happening. All the jails, all the jails in Israel here are overloaded. No room. The hospitals just as well. In Israel, there's no beds for, for, for patients. They sleep in the hallway. Today, all the doctors quit. In one department in Israel, they got tired. They cannot work like this anymore. Ten times more patients than the amount of doctors. In the last minute, they raised one million dollar donation to convince them to come back, to help the department. They refused to come back, so they cannot solve the problem. It's a zoo. Why is it? The movies with the internet today, all the violence. In America, almost every person, every second word comes out of his mouth is a curse. Even people in great universities, every second word is a curse. The mind of the people became the mind of monsters. The things that are happening, if you read the news one day, you have more crimes in one day than what we had in 10 years, 100 years ago. Even the level of the mafia guys, compared to what it was, compared to what it is today, you have no idea what's happening here. It's unbelievable what's happening. Why? More and more people want to be like these gangsters, like these people on the news, like these people on the movies. Everybody try to imitate them. One person will make tattoos all over his body, millions of kids will do the same. One person, will, they show in a film how they do drugs, millions of kids tomorrow morning will do drugs. When they came out in Israel with karate films, Bruce Lee, that was the karate films 40 something years ago in Israel. As soon as they brought it to the, to the theaters, and the people were exposed to all this karate, breaking bones, killing people. What do you think happened in the schools? I'm talking to you from experience. Everybody became Bruce Lee. All day people hit each other. Shita, boom, bam, jumping, kicking. In Israel, Bruce Lee had a special thing. It's called, what's, what's the name of it? Benjamin, Muchako, Muchako, Muchako. Two pieces of wood with a chain. 
Half of the kids in my school came with, to school with that. Became a new fashion. Everyone like this, breaking bones. You see the devastation that one film can cost thousands of people? Same thing, guns. Soon as they saw a few mafia film, Purim, everyone with guns. Before that, nobody knew what guns is. Now all the kids aiming to his head, psh, shooting. Why? People identify with the bed. Most of the customs are evil. A lot of people, they, what's their custom in Israel? Arab, Mustafa, Mahmoud, all kinds of things like that. Ninja. Bad customs. Why is it? People identify with the bed. That's what he said. Zygmunt Freud, he say, the more you show it and even speak negative about it, the more people will develop hidden desires to it. And today we see that he was right. 150 years later, there's no question who was right in this argument. He said to them, it won't help that you add a warning in the end. In Israel, they made a law. You have to write on a cigarette. Cigarette is not good for the health. It kills. Do you think that the level of smoking went up or down? Much higher now. Much higher. I'll give you another example. When people hear negative criticism, in the first week or two, it may affect them to go away from the negative. But in the long run, they cannot hold themselves. They have to follow the negative. One person told me that he went to the bookstore. He wanted to buy a book. And a guy told him, oh, it sold out in a day. He said, what? Yesterday you got it, today it sold out? He told him, yes. It was put on a ban by the rabbis. The rabbi put it in harem. So he said, so how come people bought it? So that's the, that's the key. If you want to sell books, make sure to write something in a book that get the rabbis angry. The rabbi will put you in harem. Two hours, everyone run to buy your book. That's the mind of the people. What you tell them it's not allowed, they all run to do. You tell them the book is kosher, nobody wants to touch it. You understand what's happening here or no? The elections that we had is a perfect example. Millions of attacks against Donald Trump a week. Millions. All over the channels, this news channel, newspaper, internet, CNN, all these channels. Non-stop negative Lashon Hara murder against him, one after the other. That's what got him elected. If they only spoke nice about him, he didn't have a chance Bichlal. Not even a chance to go to the second round. The only reason he got elected is because they described him as the biggest monster in history. That's what got him elected. No other explanation. Of course, you know, people are tired of these liberal rotten leaders and all the fake politics and politically correct uh, uh, behaving. So that added a lot to it. But come on, the only reason that people actually I got identified with him is they crucified him and the people from their subconscious felt I have to do something for this guy. I, someone has to be on his side. By the way, even by Hashem it's like that. It's written clearly, Elohim yevakesh nirdaf. If there is somebody that everyone goes after, even if he deserve it, Hashem comes to be on his side. Why? Everyone is against him, I'm coming to be with you. Why? Elohim yevakesh nirdaf. Zygmunt Freud told them, you, you're actually destroying the people. You're increasing their desires in their subconscious. They enjoy to read these forbidden stories and the corruption. They identify with the bad. Reading your material gives them satisfaction. That's why everyone run to these films. Which films are the best? Meaning rating. Have the best rating. Mafia, action, film with murders, film with forbidden relationship. Those are the films who sell the most. Nice, classy, decent, educational film. Barely has any views. Something with murders and all kinds of dirty language and who knows what else. 
right away, tens of hundreds of millions views. Why? That's how the people are. The Gra, the Gaon Mivilna, is speaking about the mind and the speech and the actions. There are three categories. The mind, the speech, and the actions. They are actually tools to satisfy the evil inclination, the Yetzer Hara. The Gaon Mivilna, in few places, he says, the fact that a person is speaking about the bad, giving him hidden satisfaction to his Yetzer Hara. The explanation to it is, because a person is built in three different levels, the mind, the speech, and the actions. Every part of his nefesh gets satisfaction. For instance, when a person reads the scripture on the bed, or is speaking about bed, the actual fact of speaking about it gives him satisfaction. He's not aware of it. He means well. He really hates the bed, but in his subconscious, it gives him satisfaction. Even words that are pure, you read verses in the Torah that speaks against the negative. S hiddenly inside his subconscious, it gives him pleasure and satisfaction to the three categories of his evil inclin inclination. The speech, the thought, and the action. So it, you divide the evil inclination to three channels. Thoughts, actions, and speech. So sometimes when a person speaking about an, a bad act, it satisfied the hidden yetzer of the acts. And when he speaks about negative thoughts, it satisfies hidden evil inclination about thoughts. And sometimes bad words that he speaks about, that satisfy the speech. Sometimes you can hear people scream, treif, shake it. Gilui Arayos, etc. All these kinds of sins. And they don't pay attention. By the screaming, it actually gives food to their own Yetzirah. It's very interesting. That's where the Pasuk, the, the, the say of Chazal comes from. A posel bemumo posel. Sometimes being fanatic about one issue, speaking against it all the time, it's very possible that you yourself have this desire very strongly inside and by actually condemning it you feeding your own evil inclination and giving the satisfaction it's very interesting why would a person otherwise would be so obsessed with something if he speaks generally about everything fine but if he only speaks about this this I gave an example from this book. Nothing comes from my mind. I'm just telling you what he writes here. He's the biggest Haredi psychologist, Rav Shlomo Hoffman. The biggest rabbis in Israel were asking his opinions what to do. And he said, there are organizations today and speakers that everything they do, they speak about tikkun abrit, wasting seed. That's their, all their lectures, all their books, all their videos, just about this topic. They made organization, Tikkun Abrit, Shomre Abrit. They don't speak almost about anything else. They don't speak about Shabbat, they don't speak about kosher food, they don't speak about learning Torah barely. Only about this, bringing Zohar and Gmarot and Reshit Chochma and Masechet Genom. Obsessively about this. Now what happened? A person that wants to stop making the sin and he wants to correct his way, constantly they make him think all the time, pushing him back into this. Bringing it to his awareness non-stop, non-stop, and his mind is constantly about it, actually will push this person to make more sins in this field in the future. Right now he gets scared, but the fear will run out. The fear will not last. Once the fear goes away from the genome, from the punishment, from the horrible things that will happen to him, he's going to forget the, fe the fear and the, and the punishment. And eventually it fills his subconscious so much because he constantly think about all the sins he used to make and sins that other people did because he constantly in his mind, every day, listen to that organization, or to, constantly in his mind, 
you get more negative than positive out of it. So what's the solution? You tell people it's a big sin. Whoever did it has to fix it, to correct it, and the way to fix it is to focus on doing good. First you learn what Hashem really wants. And then you don't think about, I used to do this, and I used to do that, or my mommy lost case. It's never going to end. It constantly will bring you back to those things. Focus on a better future. What's the better future? Learn Torah. Rabbi, but I made horrible sins with girls. Don't think about it. It's over. You bal tshuva now. No, but I need to do tikkunim. You don't need any tikkunim. The Gaon Nivil say. The biggest tikkun, learning Torah. You don't need to roll in the ice. You don't need to fast every day. You don't need to put your head in the ashes. You don't have to constantly sit and cry about the sins that you made. If you're going to do it, you will break up and you will become Hashem Yirachem, a complete Rasha in the end. And it happens to someone in Israel. He was going fanatic in this and he became Porek all. He became totally Chiloni again. Now, to justify what happened to him, he begins to be an attacker of the Torah. All he does is convince religious people, whatever you heard from me was not true. Now I got new proofs. That's not true. He begins to become a kofer. Why? How can he justify himself? One time you hear, the next day you're on the opposite side. So this is what's happening here. So sometimes, better not to talk about the bad of the past at all. Dealing with that too much, wanting to influence people to stop, you do not recognize that you planted back in their mind, in a subconscious, but it's there, and it will reflect in their actions. Even though you mean well, it satisfies their evil inclination, ignites it more and more and more. That could trigger more sins to come. So what do you do? Rabbi, I used to do this and I used to do this. Whatever you did, forget about it now. Now you sit and learn. Go in the yeshiva, six months, don't talk to anyone. Learn the basics. Learn, 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 learn. Six months he learn. What's the point of thinking about the back? That's it. Once he learn, he won't commit sins anymore. Now if the next 30, 40 years is going to be a tzaddik, because he's learned to write, kills his even inclination, and he doesn't have the urge to go and to do anything, what's the point of reminding him what he used to do 40 years ago? It was erased already a long time by Hashem. 30, 20, 40 years he learns Torah. Now you want to remind him what he used to do when he was 20? What's the point? He's 60 now, he's a very big Talmud Chacham. All his life is Torah now. Rabbi, remember 40 years ago he used to do the sins? What's the point? What's the point? So, the Rav Gaon, Rabbi Meir Kessler, he brought the source of the, the words of the Gaon Mivilna in Aderet Eliyahu. Aderet Eliyahu, that's the name of the book. Parashat Bereshit, Bet Tet. Perek Bet, chapter 2, verse 9. Ki yediat atov vehara, knowing the good and the bad, hura meod. Ki ma shahadam tam yoter, hu yoter meule. If you have an innocent person, Innocent. That's, by the way, an argument between Hasidim to the rest of the world. The Hasidim say, I don't want my kids to learn Ramchal. I don't want him to learn more Nevuchim of the Rambam. I don't want him to learn Jewish philosophy. Why? It's a part of our tradition. It's Rambam, it's Ramchal, it's kosher big giant Chachamim. Yes, nobody argue about that. Why should I give my kids ideas? Why should I teach them that there are so many kfira out there? Why should I bring the kfira to their mouth and now teach them how to take medicine against them? Better they won't know about it. And until 30 years ago, for sure they were right. There's no question about it. Why generating information? To create more confusion to the young people? The problem we have today, we have to reconsider what they say. Why? Because today the information is available on the internet. Until 30 years ago, they couldn't get to it. The kids, whatever they learn in Cheder or by the house, that's all they hear. They cannot hear Kfira anywhere. 
They go house, yeshiva, house, yeshiva, whatever you feed them, that's what they eat. They don't know about anything else. They don't know what really happens in the world. They don't know all the scenes, they don't know anything. Bringing it to their attention and now teaching them how to overcome this, that's not the smartest thing to do, right? It's like someone that his kids do not know anything about drugs. Nothing, they never heard about it. They don't know it exists. They're learning, a, they are in a Jewish ghetto. They never met secular Jews. They never met Goim. They're only in an environment speaking only Yiddish. Now you come to this kid and you begin to teach him about drugs. What's going to happen? He's going to be curious what it is. He's going to start looking and asking questions. You never spoke about it. He never had the, the need to even deal with that. The problem today when this horrible open world with the internet that destroyed so many souls, this shita is not as effective anymore. Because now all you need now is one rotten apple in a community, one kid that was exposed to it. It's like a mouse. You know when a mouse defines the door? Immediately he runs to tell all his friends to come. The Gemara says, rish ininu. Right away he runs, hey, we'll come, I'll come, I'll show you what I saw. Mendel, come, Yitzchak, come, Yaakov, come. What happened? Come, come, look what I found. And then hundreds can chaz v'shalom to get destroyed. Now the world changed. And if you don't change your equipment and your weapon, you lose the war. You have to be up to date. Now it's time to consider, and this is uh, anyone who can speak to the big rebels that make the decisions, now it's time to consider maybe after all it's better to prepare them to the war out there because by the time they get caught they're not ready. In one day they destroy them. Meaning, first you have to teach them the Torah is mina shamayim. Don't count on emunah anymore. Until 30 years ago he knows it's the mina shamayim because his father told him and his father knows because his father told him. Nobody had a big mind to start and listening to all the kfirah. Ani ma'amin, we ma'aminim bnei ma'aminim. We believe, we believe, we believe. It's worked for hundreds of years. We work, we believe. Today, they get ideas. They hear, people speak. Even inside the yeshivot, people speak. There are many who went off the derech. They give their life to hunt more people to drag them down with them, unfortunately. If you don't prepare the innocent kids, they may think that there's really something out there. Maybe they're right. Maybe the Torah, is, after all, is not what I thought it is. You have to prepare the remedy to the sickness. If you start preparing it after the person became sick, it will be maybe too late for you. You understand? There's not one week, not one week, that I don't get at least one or two calls from Hasidic people. I need you to speak to my brother to my son, to a, a father, to a wife that sometimes left the house, ran away, don't want to be religious anymore, or sometimes they're still in the house, but it's moments before they're about to leave. Just I got the text, I said, okay, send this woman right away to my lecture. I'm going to speak to her. She said, I don't want to hear any rabbis. She made up her mind already. Someone brought to her some kind of kfirah, she never heard anything from her life. She grew up Hasidish. He hit her. She did not have any knowledge to answer these liars, because they are big liars. All these kofrim, they make manipulation and they fool the people, especially when they see they're naive. They take advantage on the ignorance in the field. And they, and they break them. Now, don't forget that the person has Yetzirah to do bad as it is. Many of these people, they feel, ah, I'm religious all my life, I don't know what's out there. As soon as someone go and comes and put the bait in their mouth, immediately he pulls them over there very easily. Because he's, he's not so happy with his life as it is. He's not into learning. Some of the decrees that were put on him by force, he hates. And that's very dangerous. If we continue to close our eyes, we're going to lose hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of souls. It's time to re-evaluate the education system and to start teaching kids from very young age how do we know one million percent the Torah is from Hashem? There's thousands of proofs. How do we know 
thousand percent that the oral Torah is also from Hashem. How do we know Chazal really spoke divine words and not just regular opinions that every person has? There's so many proofs. So even if they find one day kfira, the amount of proofs that they learn in yeshiva, it's so substantial, immediately they make these wicked liars fly out of the window. When they come to me, they don't move me an inch. Why? I'm prepared for them. I already know, I have experience with them. If the kids would have half of my experience, <laughs> there wouldn't even be a challenge in Unfortunately, why do you think you have all these organizations, they invest so much money to drag people out of the religion, why? Because they have success. Nobody works forever unless they have success. Do you know one speaker that would speak and speak and speak and speak and not have one success and continue to speak? But to the wall? Whoa. Eventually, when you see you tried and tried and tried and not once you succeed, you lose hope. You lose desire. You don't have energy anymore. How do you build energy? Only by seeing success. Logically, naturally, physically, I wanted to retire years ago. Many years ago, who knows how many. Every time I said, that's it, I had enough. I don't have the strength anymore for it. I get Baruch Hashem few great emails, get strength for another three, four days. And then I say, okay, maybe next week I'll finish this series, that's it, I'll retire. And then something happened, I say, okay, I cannot, I have to wait another two, three weeks. And that's how it's going. If a person doesn't have any success, only aggravation, only hard work, and no success, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a rabbi, no success. Or you're a salesman, try to sell, don't sell, don't sell, don't sell, don't sell. How long are you going to stay a salesman? There's no way. You need success. These reshaim, these wicked people, they hunt people. The Christian missionary, all these fake people with the, the, the claiming all kinds of kfira. It's enough they hunt one a week. That's for them a huge success. They make a party out of it. Come, be one of us. Let's cut your payos. We'll pay for you. We'll give you a place to live. If, if, even if there is a battle in court, they're going to hire a lawyer for you. Why it's so important for them? They have the urge to relax their conscience. That's how they relax their conscience. When other people drown with you, you don't suffer as much. When you're the only one who drown, you suffer. Everyone around you is drowning, it's not so bad. In Hebrew it's called Tzarat Rabim Chatsi Nechama. When the problem is by everyone, already it's half a comfort. I'm not the only one who suffers. I told you once, I gave you an example once in class when the teacher reads the marks. Yitzchak, 20. It feels horrible. Shloime, 25. Moshe, 40. Avner, 35. The more losers joining the wagon, Yitzchak, the first one that got 25, feels better and better. By the time the teacher finished to read all the list of the losers, he already feel a winner. <laughs> Why? Ah, I'm, I'm, I'm nothing special. Everyone here is a loser. No, no problem. I'm nothing special. But if he got 25 and everyone else, 90, 95, 98, 99, 100, well, how does he feel? Every good mark that the teacher reads, he suffers more. Even though in both cases it's nothing to do with this future, it's not going to be determined based on who won and who lost besides him. It's what your life is. But it doesn't think like that. It's basically the inside feeling. So it says like this. The Gaon of Vilna, he brings about this pasuk. If you learn all the evil, it's bad. Right? The more innocent you are, the better it is. The more you're not aware, you're not aware. You live in a, some kind of a ghetto. You don't know there are murderers. You don't know the such thing pedophiles. You don't know the such thing drugs. You don't know cheating and divorce. You don't know any of it. You don't know. I once told you a story about a dad told me when he was a kid. He asked his father, Abba, what's the gerushin? What's divorce? He heard for the first time in his life the word divorce. 
and his father almost fainted. He gave him such a smack. Who told you such a word? Who taught you this word? Meaning, the kids back in a previous generation, only, I don't know, 70 years ago, not even, they didn't even know the meaning of the word Gerushim, because nobody was divorced. Everyone was married. Why are you bringing to their attention negative things that they learn about the such thing divorce? It's written in the Torah. You have to divorce your wife, you have to give her a sefer kritut. This part is skipping yeshiva. They didn't teach. All kinds of other intimate things, they skip in yeshiva, they didn't teach. Today, everybody knows about it. What's the point of skipping? <laughs> you already know it better than the Rebbe. What are you going to skip? Are you fooling yourself? But 60 years ago, of course you skip. Nobody even knows what it is, Bechlal. So the people were very innocent. Very innocent. Shepiv hu ha-shmira lechol ha-nefesh. You gotta be careful what comes out of your mouth. It's watch your soul. Shepiv hu ha-shmira lechol ha-nefesh. Persons, mouth, and organs that he makes crimes, you know, all kinds of sexual crimes with, are aim one towards the other. Meaning what comes out of your mouth show your hidden crimes. Why? Because the mouth, it's a reflection of a person. See, a person has dirty words, dirty language, all day he speaks about these things, that's what he is. When you see a person all day speaking about Torah, Gemara, Halacha, this, that's all his life. Like we have, Baruch Hashem, many of these Chachamim, that's where their mind is. Not in the other side, you understand? That's a reflection of who you are. Thinking about sins, intimate sins, is worse than the actual sin. Because the actual sin will take an hour and then it's over. Thinking about it for weeks or for months is worse than the actual sin itself. Why? It destroys your mind. It destroys everything else. It takes away your desire for Kedusha. It destroys you. Right? And also, by the way, it's bigger damage to your health than the actual crime. People think, hey, Rabbi, I have my red line. I think, I imagine, but I will never actually do. Come on, I'm afraid of karet, I'm afraid to lose my olam haba. But the problem is that the sin, although it's a very big punishment for it, which you can do later tshuva for it, the only the whole sin will be a matter of an hour, maybe even less. And it's over. You relaxed your Yetzirah and you moved on. But when you cannot do the sin, you're only thinking and thinking and thinking, it may take weeks and months and every day and it's repeating. It takes you away completely from Hashem and from holiness. And it makes damage to your body. Physical damage. Especially they're talking about men here. And that's what many people do not consider. Ah, what am I doing? Only thinking. I will never dare to do. My friend, thinking is just as bad and worse. And it's longer and it accumulates to more sins in the end. The Torah says, As soon as your eyes became a radar and you look at not modest things, that's already a sin from the Torah. Before it got to action next week, just the actual searching already became a sin. In Kabbalah, they speak a lot about not to think about the bad, only to focus on the good. It's in Kabbalah, the expression called tzadikim meirim, ve tzadikim she'ena meirim. They are righteous people that are enlightening, meaning they shine, meaning they give light, and they are ones that are not giving light. What is the difference? Tzadikim meirim, those are the ones who constantly shine on the good. Tzadikim she'ena meirim, that it's hard for them that they are wicked in the world, 
it bothers them very much the bad and they speak against the bad although they are righteous it's two different categories everybody would rather obviously to speak only about the good why even bring in the bad when you speak to religious people they already believe in Hashem they know that there is a met, they know already there is reward and punishment, they grew into it. Better to encourage them to do good. Learn more, daven more, read more Tehillim. While they, you're pushing them to do positive, you're actually making them stay away from the negative. Right? There are two ways to save a person. One is to tell them, don't go over there, Manhattan, club, bed, drugs, not modest, or come with me to the yeshiva. There's a great speech tonight. It's going to be very inspiring. You're going to see what a great speech is going to give. Without talking about the bed, where he wanted to go. Just come with me to the yeshiva. While he already comes to the yeshiva, it's not necessary anymore to bring the bed. But, not to make any mistake here, in the Torah, this, was, this advice comes from Kabbalah. In the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu spoke a lot about the bed. Read his speech. All Sefer Dvarim is Moshe Rabbeinu's speech. 50% of what he did, he spoke about good and encouraged them to do good. 50% of what he say, approximately, warned them from the bad. For instance, he said to them, Enechem haroot et asher asa Hashem lebal leele shalchu ache baal peor. Yo, I saw all the people who follow baal peor, idol worshipping, Hashem destroyed them. Why Moshe has to bring it up? Why you speak about baal peor? It's horrible. It's not good to even remind it to the people about it. And many other examples. Why? Because sometimes people need they need the love they need the positive at the same time they need the negative but if there is a way to motivate a person only by speaking to him positive only that's definitely better why even getting into the negative he's doing already everything unfortunately i'm telling you from experience the world has changed today if people do not hear what's going to be the price they pay for their sins they simply don't change. One out of a hundred maybe will. Better not to describe too much the bad. Also, when you speak about punishment, don't go into details. I made one time a lecture about Masechet Genom. Description about what's happened to the wicked people in the seven different places of hell. It was never published. It was never online. We never put it on a website and never gave it on CDs to people systematically. It's not on a website for purchase, nothing. Why? It's so harsh. It's so... I don't know the right word for it. It's so strong. In a way, it's very depressing. When you see what kind of punishments the wicked people get when they leave this world, in one hand, there's a chance that this person will wake up and tomorrow morning is going to be on the right track. That's it. No more games. If he lives with a Goya, tomorrow morning it is done with her. That's it. If he was a big thief, tomorrow morning is done. If it was Mechalel Shabbat, tomorrow morning is not going to be Mechalel Shabbat. That's what's going to happen to some of the people. The problem is that most people are soft and live in a lie and fake. And when they see something like that, they will use it as an excuse not to do anything. Do you understand what I'm saying here or no? They're going to say, Rabbi, leave me alone. I'm already a lost case. I saw what's going to be my end. That's what the Masechet Gehenom described. That's exactly me. So I'm going to end in, Mas in uh, Mador Shvi, in a place that I'll never come out of there anyway. So what's the point of eating kosher? What's the point of doing this? What's the point of going to shul? Anyway, I'm a lost case. You understand? That's a big danger. Because fakers are looking what to hang to, to continue to sing. And you just gave them the food. Here you go. Now, okay, leave me alone. That's why if you remember in previous lectures, I explained many times, don't tell the kids 
or your students about what kind of losers they are and how, how do you do this and how do you do that. Tell them someone that is a tzaddik is usually doing this. One day you go up, you'll be like that. You don't tell them you're nothing, you're loser, you this, you this, well, because what's going to happen in the end? So, well, since I'm such a lost case, why even trying? Let me do whatever I want, at least I have this world. Over here, I'm a lost case, no? At least I enjoy this world. Anyway, I don't have Olam Abba. Anyway, I'm not going to be a big Chacham. Anyway, I'm not going to be a Rabbi. So what's, what do I need this for? Why do I even go to Yeshiva Bechlal? Nothing's going to come out of me anyway. And from here to total destruction, the road is very, very short. So what's the idea? To take what is good about or she and develop it. You have this talent. You're so good with talking to people. Maybe you should consider this. You're doing this so you're davening so good. Maybe you should, you know, we'll make you the chazan one day. Something to give him hope. Meaning, okay, I'm not the best, but at least I have some good things about me. The more you talk about the good, the more you make a big deal out of the good, you encourage people and inspire them for the good. It's going to be influenced and would like to identify with the good. But if you talk too much only about the bad, you're doing this, you're doing that, why are you doing this, why are you doing that, then it's going to make him lose hope. One time you make him aware that there is such a thing bad and that's enough. He got the point. You don't need to repeat it every day. There are obstacles you have to be careful of. Don't make big deal out of the bad. Like I gave before about this organization with Tikkun Abrit. All day, all night, non-stop about this. Until people lose hope. Ah, I cannot correct my sins. And that's it. He doesn't have the energy to continue. By the way, even if, if it's true, even if it's true, it's written in one of the holy books that someone who committed these sins is almost a lost case. There's no such thing lost case, there's almost a lost case. Like went with a married woman. It's a very big sin, very hard to fix it. According to Kabbalah, wasting seed, horrible things, it's very difficult to fix. If you tell it to the Bebalei Tshuva, you destroy them mentally. They won't have the energy to try. If you hide it from them 10 years until they become Bnei Torah, 10 years later, when they already learn 10 years Torah, they're not going to throw it to the garbage now. 10 years of their life they put in Yeshiva. Slowly, slowly they'll find it. Don't worry, they know how to find books. You're not the, the first one who knows how to find it. They'll find it in the Zohar, they find it in different books in Rashid Chochmah, in, in the Ari, they'll find it. By the time they find it, they will be so well established, it won't break their spirit. I just learned 10 years Torah, okay. That was maybe 10 years ago. Now I'm not the same guy. And then there's words of Rabbeinu Yonah and Rambam that are very encouraging, that will make a balance in a situation. Especially today, when, when we live in such a horrible generation, so dirty, so not modest, that Hashem will take to consideration the challenges and the dirt around us. Because many of the people today that are half-righteous, if they lived 400 years ago, in a, in a generation back then, they would be fully righteous. The reason that they're half-righteous now it's because of where they live, where they grew up, where they go, in the school they go. <laughs> they cannot run away from the bad. 400 years ago, the, the streets were clean. You walk in the street, it was modest. Today, you cannot walk on any block in the world. Nowhere. Not even in a religious neighborhood. There's no more modesty anymore. No more. No modesty in Borough Park. No modesty in Flatbush. No modesty in Monsi. No modesty anywhere. Not in Bnei Brak. Rav Shach told Rav Aderet 30 years ago. Stay in Monsi, don't come to Bnei Brak. Why, he said to him? He said, ah, he was in his 90s. I cannot come out to Rehov Rabbi Akiva. It's the main religious street in Bnei Brak. 
I cannot come out. He was in his 90s. I doubt that if he saw Bichlal. I cannot come out to the street. And this is the most religious area in Israel, Bnei Brak. You know, similar to 13th Avenue in Borough Park. Similar. I cannot come out to the street. Why? Well, yeah, maybe most women are mothers. It's enough that 5% are not. And here you go, you cannot walk on the street. The idea is that the world is different than what it used to be. Five, four, five hundred years ago, nobody dared, nobody to be on a street like this. Did you see the picture I put on my Facebook page? How the Goyot used to go to the beach in the year 1900? 115 years ago? Unbelievable how they used to dress. You cannot believe it. You cannot see a finger, nothing, everything covered, dresses like this. Extra, extra, extra Rebitzen. If a woman would dress like this today, she would be known as the most modest woman in a Jewish world. Any one of these goyot. Do you know if they wanted to go into the water, they used to have a special caravan with wheels that they push it into the water. Now nobody sees me when I go into the water. I couldn't believe it. Like wagons. Goyot. Say it today to the Jewish women. They think you're crazy. So that generation is, is a different world. Hashem takes into consideration. Uh, it's not my opinion. The Ari said to Rabbi Chaim Vital 500 years ago, and it's needless to say today. He told him, I want you to know that one little mitzvah in this generation count like a huge one. Why? Compared to previous generation when it was much easier to be tzaddik. Not that there was no kfirah. Kfirah there was always in the time of the Gemara. There was a lot of kofrim, tzdukim. Kofrim you always had, but even the kofrim dressed. Do you know the Prime Minister of Israel, the first one, Ben Gurion? When you hear Rabbi speaking about him today, you describe a monster, hater of Torah, someone that is a communist. I show you a one hour interview with him. He's more religious than some of the religious members in the Israeli Knesset. When the guy asks him, What do you think? Our existence here in Israel, surrounding by so many Arabs. Is nature or is the hand of God? You have to see what answer he gave. <laughs> Some modern Orthodox rabbis don't give such good answers today. Of course it's from God. Everything is from God. They call him Kofer. Ben Gurion is known as a big Kofer. I wish all the Kofrim would be like this. Look at this interview. Where the, and I was shocked when I saw it for the first time. So wow. All the speeches I heard, they describe him as such a hater of God and communist in the end he said everything is from God of course he saves us here and of course he's put <laughs> it's unbelievable <laughs> it was still not Shomer Mitzvot but at least in his mind he recognized Hashem and the miracle that Hashem brought us to Israel and he wasn't a fool like the lefty liberals today he said Arabs will never leave us alone we must be strong to protect ourselves from them because as soon as we'll be weak they'll destroy us can we make peace with them? Never. They'll never rest until they destroy us. That's his words. And he was considered a lefty. It wasn't the right. Begin was right. He was left. The lefties of today, Shem Irachem. I'll tell you a story. When I was a teacher in Midrashia in Pardes Chana, and years ago, Shnat Tashach, 1948. That's when Israel became a state. Orarti la talmidim et ha-yesod haze lo ledaber al ara. I educated my student, don't talk about the bad. Focus on the good. Don't make big deal out of it. Just focus always on good, good. You should do good, you should do good, you should do good. They will encourage a person to do good. I told them, even when the Torah speaks about something bad, it's only for a person to know that it's bad and to stay away from it. But the Torah does not give a lot of description about it. For instance, the Torah speaking about Baal Peor, but the Torah does not describe what it was. Not the whole ceremony. This we know from the Chachamim. But in the text it's not written. Or other crimes that people did in the Torah, the Torah spoke about the crime and about maybe the punishment, but without going into details. Even when the Torah wants to speak about a Jewish single woman, 
she's not allowed to have a relationship with a man until she married to him, the Torah doesn't call her a prostitute. The Torah call her Kedesha, come from the word Kadosh, the opposite. It's called Lashon Sagina Or. You know what it means, Sagina Or? A blind person. Why they call it this expression, meaning all the people see. Here and there you see people that are the opposite, they don't see. So the Torah speak in the opposite language. Instead of calling her uh, not modest or act of prostitution, the Torah says, Lot yek desha bebnot Israel. And everybody got the point. Right? You understand? So it's very interesting how Hashem used clean language. Instead of saying bad, sometimes he says the Torah not good. Why? Why should I say the word bad if I can say not good and people will get the point? Even to that tiny precise things, it's, it's taken into consideration. Idol worshipping. From the Torah you're allowed to know what it is? Show me one place in the Torah that the Torah went into the description of the idols and how they are and what the Goim used to do. 52 restrictions in the Torah are idol worshipping. From the 365. 52! It's a big number. Not to worship idols, but not once it described exactly what that idol was. Why the Torah didn't say it was a statue with this image, this size, the going is to come and bring and put and shave their hair and put it and turn their back to it and all kinds of things. Why the Torah didn't describe this? The Torah just said the name, sometimes not even the name, and the punishment of those who will do it, and that's it. In between, it's out of the book. Can you say that by learning the whole Torah, do you know now exactly what idol worshipping is? The answer is no. You don't know. You know the rules. But you don't know the specific idol worshipping. You don't know. Esav Arasha. We know Esav was wicked. What was his wickedness? We don't read anything about it in the Torah. You don't read in the Torah that he was a rapist, that he was a murderer, that he was an idol worshipper. You don't read it in the Torah. This we only know from the oral Torah, from Chazal. We didn't know all the sins of Esav. From the Torah, the Torah highlighted the good he did. He respect his father, he went to make him a meal. He cried when he didn't get the blessing. There's also some negative about him that he was willing to give the Bechorah in his Olam Abba. But overall, overall, what do we see? The Torah does not highlight too much the bad, the negative. In the end of Parashat Vayetze, the Torah describes in few verses 400 years of the life of Esav. 400 years. But when I speak about Avraham, Yitzchak and Yaakov, the Torah speaks a lot about them. A lot. Esav and his children, 400 years of history, few verses, that's it. Yaakov, Yitzchak and Avraham, the Torah speaks about them full chapters. Again, another chapter, another chapter, many, many chapters about them. Rashi brings a mashal, a parable, about a jewel, a ruby, that fell in the sand. When a person found it, he throw the sand and he stay with the, with the ruby. That's the secret. Once you have sand, you don't talk about it. When you have a jewel, you speak a lot about it, right? If you found a lot of sand, you went to look for gold. Sand, 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 comes in a basket. Sand, sand. Do you tell your father when you go home, Abba, I found so much sand today? If you found one piece of gold, Abba, I found one piece. If you found two, Abba, I found two. All day you talk about the two pieces of gold. When Hashem wants to speak about Esav, just to describe him, to know that there was some, somebody like that, and the Goim came out of him, and the Nazis will come out of him, few verses, and that's it. Let's not even talk too much about him. All the other wicked also. And when he speaks about the Tzadikim, again and again and again. Do you know how many wicked people live from Adam until Avram? You only hear about few of them, 
maximum all together one page, if you add everything together. Avraham alone you have pages, Yitzchak pages, Yaakov pages. Why? Focus on a good. Rashi writes, לפי שהם חשובים לפני המקום העריך בהם. Also the genealogy. Genealogy of the Jews, the Torah described many times in, in long verses. The genealogy of the wicked, nothing. Few words and that's it. What do we see from here? If you want to influence people to do good, don't focus too much and too long on the bad. Admire the good. Emphasize the good. Speak a lot about the good. Give examples from the good. That's how you educate people to be anxious for good, to want the good. Not only by speaking about the bad that people do all the time. Once at least you have to tell them. Not allowed to do this and this, it's horrible, Hashem hates it, yes. But that's it, not every day, non-stop, non-stop. The person would lose hope. We have to just make a comment here. What we say that we should not focus too much on a bed, it's mainly in conversations. In conversations, better not to talk too much about it. But a person has to make himself promises and perhaps vows to stay away from the bed, like it says in Shulchan Aruch, that Jews were doing for thousands of years. I will penalize myself if I will do such and such. I will do this if I do. Why? Because that keeps you away from the bad. How you ignite the will of the people to do good? There are many ways. Let's give an example. Rav Iser Zalman Melzer Zatzal was the Rav of Rav Shach. When he was going up the stairs to his house, and he stopped in the middle. Stop on the stairs. He stood by the door of his house and he did knock, knock on the door. Did not. And then he went downstairs. And then after 15 minutes he woke up. He was standing by the door of his house, listening, and he goes down. Go take a walk. Few times like this. And he's not knocking on the door and he's not entering. Someone asked him, Rabbi, you are tired after teaching all day in yeshiva. Why you don't walk in? What is this? You go up, you stand, you go down, you go up. So he answered, I came home and I, answer, and I heard that the maid, the maid, she's singing. The maid is singing. If I will walk in, immediately she will stop singing. She knows a woman cannot sing in front of a man. She knows I cannot listen to her. And I know that this maid is very poor. Very poor and miserable. How much good she have in her life? What does she have in her life? I'm gonna walk in, I'll take away the pleasure she has to sing. I did not want to cut her pleasure. When you tell stories like this to your student, do you know how much good you build into them? That they wanna be righteous like this person? They wanna be, wow, look at him, how he was thinking about this. I should be like this also. You can give 10 stories about evil people that don't care and they walk in and they scream, be quiet while you're singing. Yes, it will get them scared not to be like them. But you can, have, you can do the same by telling one story about good and makes great impression on the people. The Gaon Mivilna Ed on the introduction of the Rambam to Shmona Prakim. There's what he writes. Three things. What are the three things? Elu ha-shlosha hu keneged shlosha s'chalim sheba'adam. Person has three different intelligence or intelligences. I don't know if there's a word like this in plural. Ha-sechel ha-iyuni. Ha-sechel ha-machshava ve-sechel ha-maase. The intelligence of the thinking the intelligence of the action and the intelligence iuni. Iuni means darkei shamaim. How the world, the galaxies, all these things. 
שכל המחשבה means how to correct the bad traits not to be angry, not to be stingy, not to be jealous and שכל המעשה is how to act properly these three kinds of wisdoms they are separated and it's not necessarily that if you have skills in one of them you will have the, in the other two for instance one person can be very bright in Sechel Ayuni great astronom he knows galaxy, science, all kinds of things so he's very good with that and very bright but he's very weak in the practical intelligence, in actions, in to do things correctly, to do things correctly with his hands. It's very not good, not practical. One person can be very special in actions, is very practical, but in mind is very weak. Or sechel amachshava, which is a separate one, meaning how to translate what you learn into actions. Some people are very strong with that and some people are very weak with that. For instance, sometimes you talk to a person about the horrible traits that he has. It's like talking to the world. What's going on here? How, how, this person, what, what part of what I say he didn't get? He's not capable of understanding. Sometimes you hint to someone about something he does wrong, immediately he fix himself. I got it. Rav Shach. Listen to what Rav Shach say. Shloime, how do you explain the phenomena that people come to me? Avrechim, people that learn Gemara in Yeshiva, married people, not little kids. Avrechim, they come talking to me in, in learning, in Gemara. Their understanding in the Gemara is in a very high level. And in case you didn't know, there's nothing more difficult than Gemara. It's the highest learning in the whole world, in all learning, not only in Judaism. And I enjoy very much to talk to them about Gemara, Rashi, Tosfot, Maharsha, they're great. But when they begin to talk to me about the world, about what's happening in the world, they're talking totally off the truth, off subject, like their mind is not working politics, economy, all kinds of things that connects to the world. Children, raising children, marriage. Mamash, their mind is, uh, is blocked. Rav Shloimo, he answer. They probably try to take advantage on a Rosh Yeshiva for their own good. So they start talking to you about Gemara, knowing you love it. And then they try to lead the Rosh Yeshiva, meaning Rav Shach, to something that they want. That they can say later, Rav Shach told me such and such. Rav Shach said, no, let me explain to you. Sechel Yuni, in their intelligence, their wisdom, they're very strong. But in Sechel HaMachshava, in a practical everyday life, like they say in America, street smart. They're very weak. You find sometimes people so clever in Gemara, so bright, their mind is like a computer. Such memory, such fast thinking, such deep understanding in every step through the entire journey. And then when you talk to them about the world, total, total, excuse my language, fools. They don't know anything. Even what, what does it mean to have a bound checks? Nothing. No, they don't know anything from their life. You wonder to yourself how naive they can be. How naive they can be. Naive is very dangerous, you know. When the people recognize you naive, right away all the blood suckers, they come to suck your blood, to destroy you. The leech. Why is it? They recognize the weakness. We can grab from here. If he doesn't have a brother or someone that watch over him, they rip him apart. The Rambam, in few places, is, this is what he writes. Ikar HaMatara Shel Pirke Avot. He's talking about Pirke Avot. And the introduction of Shmona Prakim is to teach the human being how 
to understand the free will, to choose. Shiyeh bocher, to choose correctly. That's, the, that's why Pirkei Avot was written. What do you think was written? To tell you how great some of the Chachamim used to be and some of the nice things they used to say? The entire concept that the whole Torah is standing on, the foundation of the Torah is the free will. That's what makes us different than the animal. If a person doesn't have a free will, Hashem, how is Hashem commanding him to do something that he's unable to? He's a robot. Why are you telling me not to do or, or to do? It's not in my hand, I'm a robot. Obviously we're not a robot. Why will I be punished for something that I'm doing if I'm not choosing to do it? Why I deserve a punishment or a reward? Why would, to, to begin with? So from here we understand that the whole 613 commandments and the reward and punishment, it's all based on one foundation. That a human being is choosing 100% if to do good or bad. Everything else he doesn't choose. If you be a male or a female, nobody asks you. Who your parents are going to be, nobody asks you. If you be successful in ma making money or not, it's not in your hand. If you be healthy or sick, it's also not in your hand. If you live long life or short, you can affect it with your actions, but overall Hashem already wants you here for a long time or for a short time. Depend on your tikkun. If you have a bright brain from young age or you be foolish, it's not in your hand. You see by the kids, some trying very hard, they can understand. Some understand in a minute. It's not in your hand. None of the above is in your hand. You be handsome or not, it's not in your hand. You be pretty or not, it's not in your hand. Certain DNA issues, it's not in your hand. To be righteous or wicked, 100% in your hand. And that's why you get judged only on that particular thing. Nothing else. Nobody gets judged about his look. Nobody gets judged about if he's healthy more or less. It's not in his hand. Or if you're male or female. Or if you're a Jew or Goy. Goyim don't get punished because they're Goyim. They'll get punished if they're idol worshippers. But if they just go in, they don't get punished. They can go to heaven. They have their own heaven. Nobody gets punished for how he was born and created. Only for not listening to Hashem's advice and commands. The Rambam says to explain the foundation of the soul and the spirit and the nefesh of the human being. Ma'em kochot nefesh The energies that you have inside your nefesh. Why it's important to clarify that you know how I can change my bad habits and my bad desires, that I can choose the good and I will not be a slave of the bad habits and the evil inclination. I can control my will and my desires and I'm able to keep Tariag Mitzvot in the most productive, good way. Time is running out. We have five minutes left. I just want to see if by next week we'll be able to finish. More very, very possible that next week we'll be able to finish the series. Sometimes when a person is born in a certain fortune, this man, that man, it's defecting what kind of traits he's going to have or if he's going to have wealthy life or not wealthy life, healthy life, not healthy life, depend on a mazal, right? Therefore, it's forcing us to be good or bad. Here I was born in mazal ma'adim. I have to be a murderer. Ma'adim adom, blood. No, you can be a moel. You can be a shochet, making kosher meat. You don't have necessarily to be a murderer. You have desire for blood, yes. Maneuver it to a positive thing. You understand? And uh, you, you have desire for certain things. Find a way that it's kosher and do it over there. No problem. You understand? When Shimon killed Reuven, was his choice or Hashem wanted Reuven to die? That's the question. That's a famous question. One person named Shimon went and just killed someone called Reuven. Shimon was supposed to die or no? Reuven chose to kill or he was forced on him? It's a very critical question for life. 
If Shimon was supposed to die, then what do you want from Reuven? I mean, the other, the other way around. If Reuven was supposed to die, what do you want from Shimon? If the Jews were supposed to die, what do you want from the Nazis? If the Jews were supposed to die, what do you want from Paro and from the Egyptians? They're supposed to die, that's what Hashem wanted, leave them alone. What do you want from them? They're doing Hashem a favor. They're actually doing Hashem's will, right? Ech itachen, gam ken alav itbarach tzadik veyashar hu she'anusho al poal she'efshar, she'lo efshar, she'i efshar lo she'lo yaseu. Now what do you think? Hashem wanted Reuven to die, so he used Shimon to kill him. And now Hashem is going to punish Shimon for something he's not guilty of? Is it possible? He said death penalty to the murderers? Right? But if life and death is only an end of Hashem, life and death is an end of Hashem. Meaning now Reuven, the fact that we see him dead in front of us, that means Hashem wanted him dead. That means Shimon did a favor to Hashem. Why do we have to execute him now? It's a catch-22 here. Right or wrong? Even if he wanted so much not to kill him, it wasn't in his hand. Hashem decreed on Rosh Hashanah that he will die today, this Reuven. So what's the answer? Omnam ha'emet asher en safek bo The truth with no doubt Shepeulot ha'adam kulam mesurot lo Everything a person chooses, it's in his hand Im irtze yase veim lo irtze lo yase You wanna do, you do You don't wanna do, you don't do Nobody force you To good or for bad Umibilti ekrach sheyakrichu alav No one force you to do it and because of that, it's need, needed to command the person. That's why Hashem warned us, I'm putting the good and the bad in front of you, the life and the good, the curse and the blessing. Choose always the positive, meaning it's in your hand. If you choose good or bad, and I'm not forcing you what to choose. And there are punishments for those who don't follow the instructions. And there is a reward to those who listen. If you hear and if you don't hear. And you have an obligation to teach your children to follow the good. And you have an obligation to robots, why are you wasting time? Why? That's not in the hand to be good or bad. It was determined already. And all these things. After this is what Hashem forced us to do. To do good or bad as he, as he wished. Now Hashem is forced to teach you what's good and what bad. Because you can choose what to do. Now Hashem has to educate you what's good and what's bad. That you'll know, now when Hashem told me he likes this and he hates this, this is good and this is bad, that's what I have to want to do. Not what I like, what Hashem said. Okay. Reward and punishment is 100% honesty. A person has to get himself used to do good. Until it becomes your nature, your talents, your positive. Stay away from the bad. Until it will get out of your system. That it's inside you. ולא יאמר שאין העניין שאינם יכולות להשתנות כי כל עניין אפשר להשתנות מן הטוב אל הרע ומן הרע אל הטוב. Don't ever dare to say that's the way I am רבי. I cannot change. That's how I am. I'm angry, I'm gonna die angry. And I'm generous and I will always be generous. And I'm stingy and there's nothing I can do about it. Not true. I'm jealous, I can't control it. Of course you can. You work on it, you change. For good you can change, you can change also for bad. 
ברשות האדם היא המצווה והעבירה, to do מצוות הן עבירות, it's 100% in your hand. ומה שירצה לעשותו יעשה, רק אם יענישהו השם על חטאו, שיבטל רצונו, כמו שביארנו, שקנה על המעלות ובחיות בידו, ובזה, ומפני זה צריך לו שישתדל וכולי. טוב, just one thing, I just want to answer this. If Hashem decree that Reuven will die in a specific date this year, everybody except the Or HaChaim, Or HaChaim HaKadosh has a very unique opinion, very hard to understand, but that's it, that's Or HaChaim HaKadosh, he lived 300 years ago. He said that it's possible that a person will kill another person, that Hashem did not decree the person to die. Meaning on Rosh Hashanah Hashem gave you life, And although you're written in a book of life, someone can kill you. Someone that you got angry, he chose to kill you and he can kill you and interfere with Hashem's will. But that's a unique opinion. Everybody else says nobody can touch you or even take a hair of your head unless Hashem agreed. So if someone will steal from you and Hashem didn't want, Hashem will give you the money in a different way and he will give him a punishment. Or Hashem will prevent him to begin with from stealing from you. Direct him to a different place. Or your door gets stuck or you won't find the money. Or even if he found the money, you left it here on a table and he stole it because he has a free will. Hashem will give it to you in a different way. And a week later you find money on the street. You don't see the connection. But Hashem will get it back to you. But what about life and death? Everything Hashem can adjust. But what about life and death? Over here, how you adjust? One adjustment, even according to the Or HaChaim, that you come back in reincarnation. He killed you, Hashem will make it up to you. You won't lose. For, to lose from it, for sure, you cannot lose if you're innocent. That's for sure. That's one of the 13 principles of Judaism. But according to most opinion, he cannot touch you. If he wants to kill you, he won't be able to. Either the gun won't work, or he will in the last minute be distracted, or he will shoot you, but you won't die because Hashem can decide if the bullet will kill you or not, and all kinds of other things like this. If you're supposed to die, Hashem doesn't need Shimon to kill you. No. The tree can fall on your head. A lion can kill you. A bomb can kill you. Muhammad can put a bomb and you can pass by. Hashem has many ways, a car, something, I don't know, a lightning. Millions of ways to get rid of a person. He doesn't decree on an individual to go kill you. Now since you, de you deserve to die and this person has a will to kill you, Hashem made him succeed. If he Hashem doesn't want you to die, he will not succeed. And there are many cases like this. I had a neighbor in Lower East Side, Alava Shalom, Ezra Shulent. He told me a few times they tried to kill him in the Holocaust. And every time a miracle happened. One time the bullet didn't shoot and he hit him on the head and left it. One time he was standing in line, they started to shoot people, then one Nazi showed up. Wait, 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 don't kill him. I need somebody with small fingers. Started to check their fingers. He was a very low, very short man. He had small fingers. I need, why? They, to, to knit baskets. They need somebody in a factory to knit baskets. They used to do it by hand. Look, oh, you come. And that's how I got saved. And in the end, he came here to New York, he lived in, uh, he, he learned in Borough Park by the Mattersdorf, by the Hatam Sofer Yeshiva, and he got married and have children, and an old Bnei Torah, <laughs> everything, because he had little fingers, technically. Hashem runs the world. Mamash, before we finish, one last minute. Maybe we should leave it, I think, for next week, because if I get in, start with that, it's going to take me more than a minute. All right, so basically we're done uh, chapter 12, chapter 13 today, no? Or 13 today. Okay, we have Bezrat Hashem one more lecture next week and we'll finish. That's it. We have a few more pages left. We will finish it for sure next uh, Monday. Bezrat Hashem, if the weather will allow. Please don't miss the, the final lecture on Monday because if you participate in a siyum, in a way, it counts like you finish the whole thing, in a way. That's why a lot of people, they don't learn, but they always make sure to go to Siyum Masechet. Yeah? So they count like they finish the whole Shas, but when they come to Shamaim and they say, okay, explain the Gemara, they won't know one page to explain. 
but I, they were hundreds of times eating kugel and drinking lechaim and siyum masechet, but they don't know one chapter in a Gemara. Better than nothing, at least they participate. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Baruch Adonai Leolam. Amen. Amen.